being inspired, there we go, being inspired by the, the worship team, I'd like to lead this with you. And I'll tell you why. When I, I was, uh, I just retired from being the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Vacaville, California, after 25 years, 25 years as, a, as their pastor, and um, I enjoyed it uh, very much. But when I first came there, there was a young lady who came from a ministry in Sacramento. Uh, it was a, a ministry that ministered to young people like yourself uh, who were on the street, though. In other words, these kids were basically like 15, 16-year-olds that were homeless. And a lot of them had got caught up in a lot of bad things, from drugs to you name it. Anyway, there was a young lady with the group. She was 17 years old, and she sang this song. This was 1990, and it has stuck with me, and I've taken it everywhere I have went for the last 25 years. So I want to teach it to you, and hopefully you'll continue to, to spread it. It's called Don't Give Up. And here, here's the melody and how it goes. I'll sing through one time. It's only two verses, and it's real easy to get. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. Don't give up. Someone really cares. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. And that someone is the Lord. All right, come on, let's try it now. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. Don't give up. Someone really cares. Don't give up. Someone really loves you, and that someone is the Lord. Now, the second verse is the same melody, and it sounds a lot, but it's a little bit different. And what I usually like to have young people do is this. When, whenever there's a lot of young people in, uh, in an assembly, I know there's also been a lot of drama in your life. Anybody here got a lot of drama going on in their lives? Okay, about three or four of you. And, <laughs> and young people have a lot, a lot of drama going on. And, it, and it's real drama. Things happen. Your friends don't like you no more. Or somebody you like is cute, says that they don't want to be your boyfriend or your girl. And that's real heavy stuff, you know. I mean, that's like the world ending. And so um, this next verse kind of helps us get focused back on on, on the Lord and our relationship with him, and it's called keep the faith. It's the same thing, keep the faith. What I want you to do, though, with this one, I'm going to sing it through, and the second time around, you can join me on the first time, but we'll do it the second time. I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to just sing it to them, and you tell them to keep the faith. It may be that they're not going through anything at all, but if they are, then here you can do some ministry. All right, here's that second verse. Keep the faith, someone really loves you. Keep the faith, that means hold on to Jesus. Someone really cares. Keep the faith, someone really loves you. And that someone is the Lord. Now this time around, let's look at somebody and sing it to him, okay? Keep the faith, someone really loves you. Keep the faith, someone really cares. Keep the faith, someone really loves you. And that someone is the Lord. Come on from the beginning, last time. Don't give up. Someone really loves you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Someone really cares. Don't give up. 
Someone really loves you, and that someone is the Lord, and that someone is the Lord. Father, sometimes we feel as if we don't have anybody but you. You're the one that tells us that we are special to you. There's nothing else that you have made, and you've made everything in this world. Everything that is, is made by you. But we are the only thing that has the potential of being like you. We are the only thing that you have created, that you have made, that is made in your image. Lord, help us to become better at that. Help us to look more like that, like Jesus. It's in your name that we pray and give all praise. Amen. All right, this, um, our second, yes, what did we talk about yesterday? Yeah, the head, that in order to have the authority of Christ, and remember, authority, I got to watch how I use this, Authority means that there's somebody over you, right? There's somebody that I'm supposed to listen to. And uh, if you were in the military and you were a private, then you'd have sergeants and lieutenants and generals and these people that are over you, and they have authority. In, in, in the church, we, we don't have that kind of person. We don't have to listen to people at all. We don't have to. But because we love Jesus Christ and because he loved his church, we know that we get things done better when we work together, which means that we have to have leaders over us, the leaders of your church, your elders, your pastors, your directors. You couldn't have this good praise brand if somebody didn't lead it, which means that even though I want to sing all the songs, I'm going to submit to authority and I'm going to do my part. Am I, am I making sense to you? That authority means that there's somebody that's over me that I will respect and I will listen to. In the case of what we are been talking about here yesterday and we're going to continue to talk about today, that's Jesus Christ. Let me just deviate for just a moment. There's a lot that's going on in the world today in terms of, I'm sure you've heard it, the term Black Lives Matter. And there appears to be a divide somewhat between law authority and, and people. I think most of you have seen that, some of the things on TV and a lot of people in uprest, uh, uh, unrest and, and so forth. And, and let, me, let, me, let me just say this to you. Nobody's perfect and and nobody's great, but I want to stand before you and I want to encourage you as I encourage all young people. We need to be law-abiding people. You cannot just do whatever you want to do in society. You cannot just go and tell the law, I'm going to do what I want to do. We, We have to work with our law enforcement. We have to work with our teachers. We have to work with the people in our society in order for the place, for our uh, society to be better. Am I making sense to you? And I want to say something to you. It's not just black lives that matter. All lives matter. Let me hear you say that. All lives matter. Yeah, all lives matter. And that's even the people who are in authority. The Bible even speaks about it, doesn't it? It says pray for the people who are in authority. Sometimes you don't like those people, or sometimes those people are being, being hard and difficult with you. And I'm not saying it's always right, but the Bible says to pray for them, to love them. That's a, that's a hard thing to do, but that's what God calls us to do. So the authority of Christ, and we've been talking about on yesterday the, uh, the head. We've got to get his word in our head, in other words, to understand that authority. It's sort of like if I want to have a relationship with you, then I need to understand where you're coming from. You need to understand somewhat where I'm coming from. Then 
we can have a real relationship. I don't believe that you can have a real relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't understand why he asked you to do the things that he asked you to do. It says they were cut to their heart. This is coming from Acts where Paul had, uh, he was talking to that multicultural crowd who had just seen the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And they had, he had gone through this uh, whole big speech about it historically what had happened and it says that when the people heard this head they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles now what should we do and we're going to talk about that this evening but right now we're going to talk about the heart now what does the heart mean well the per- heart, definition of heart is I'm using it and I, I want you to understand something do me a favor go like this a minute right you got your finger what is that Right there that you're feeling. It's going beep, beep, beep. What is that? That's your heart. That's not the heart I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, I just want to make, make plain that we understand that when God wants to have authority over your heart, I'm not talking about this muscle right here. I'm talking about something else that's more akin to what the Bible is speaking of. So I'm defining heart in this way. The person, place, or thing that you value the most. Are you with me? We, we like to think about when people fall in love with somebody, we give them our what? Our heart. But you're not talking about this. You don't give this to focus. If you gave it to them, then that would be the end of the relationship. You'd be dead. Uh, but, but what you're saying is, is that I value this relationship. Ah, I value this. When I got married... To my wife, 43 years ago, and she still looks the same to me. Well, I don't know how it happens. I look different, but she looks the same. Um, 43 years ago, I gave her my heart. Not this heart. I still have the same heart here. But what I said was, I'm forsaking all others for you alone. You're the one that I value in relationship next to Jesus Christ even more, hey, hear this, even more than my mother and father, I value our relationship. I'm going to take it a step further. We're going to have children. We had four kids. Those were the baddest kids in the whole world. No, I'm just kidding. They weren't <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they were bad. But even more than the children we have. Our really, we're going to have a, a relationship with those kids, but they're not going to be more important to me than you are. I value this relationship with you as my wife. Am I making sense to you? Well, what you say to Jesus Christ is, the, uh, when we talk about heart, the person, place, or thing that you value the most, that which is most important to you. So when you say that I accept Jesus into my heart, you're not talking about your nepesh or your, your cardia, your physical heart. You're talking about the most valued relationship in the whole wide world. There is a word in the Bible that is used several times. I'm going to show you some of the verses. If you have your, uh, ca- uh, your phone, you can take a picture of it because we won't have time for you to go through all of the, the scripture here. But it's going to talk about fear. Because when you really value something, and especially when we're talking about a person, again, I use my wife as an example, I value the relationship with her. I fear that one day we're not going to have that relationship. Now, I'm not afraid in the sense that I'm, I'm scared of her, but I've, I've come to realize something. I think I mentioned to you earlier this week that her mother died and it's gotten both of us and she was a little older she's 90 years old and so those things come but death can come much earlier which would mean that we no longer would have that same relationship I also have a lot of people who have come to me as a pastor who have been married as long as I have 40 something years even and they say to me pastor I don't want them anymore. And 
I cringe inside because I'm saying, you've invested 40-something years, 30-something years, 20-something years, and you're going to tear up your family? When you fear God, what that means is, is that I fear, I should fear not having that relationship. Am I making sense to you? That if I remove myself from relationship with God, that should fear me. And there may be some young people in here today. There may be some older people. I don't know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You ought to fear that. Because not having a relationship with Jesus Christ means that you don't have the most valued thing in the whole universe. And that's the one who made you. The scripture I was talking about are these. So why don't you just take your phone and, and just, I was going to have you look up one or two of them, but we're not going to have time to do they All of them refer to fear. And just take a picture of it. Just take a picture of it. Yeah, that's one of the things I love about most of the phones today. I hate that, that you know, the phones kind of take uh, people away from one another a lot because people are always on them doing something. You do everything on a phone today. But you also can do good stuff. You can take a picture. <laughs> and then and study it later. Now, don't, I see some of you with your camera turned towards you. Don't take a selfie. This is not the time for a selfie. I didn't say take a selfie. I see you over there. Take a picture of this so that you can look these up. I didn't see anybody over there taking it, but I thought you might would enjoy that little thought right there. Okay. When you continue to direct your life, when you're the one who's in authority, then, and Christ is on the outside. Now, Christ is always, this is the way you were born, then you're not in relationship with him. The only way, the only way that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ is that he must be on the throne. That, that chair is a throne right there. He, he's the one that's got to be on the throne. He's got to be the one that's directing. He's got to be the one in authority. You can't say, I'm going to tell God what to do. You, you cannot say, well, you know what? This time, I'm going to do it my way. Every, everybody else may decide, you know, we're going to do it another way. The government may decide we're going to do it another way. But it will not change the mind of God. Why is that? Because the Bible says that God doesn't change. He changes not. He's not like a, a person who changes his, their mind one day and they, they, uh, another day they're another thing. No. You see, when I'm in relationship with Christ, to love Christ, to have him in my heart, means that he is the most valued thing. Not me anymore, but he is the most valued thing. And his direction is the most valued thing to me. I'd like for us, uh, you, and you don't have to go to your Bible right now if you, unless you just want to, but I'd like to use a, uh, a real person who lived um, back during the Old Testament time by the name of Jonah and uh, to get a, a, a picture of this whole thing of, of loving God. You know, Jonah was supposed to love God. He was a preacher, as a matter of fact. Uh, he would be akin to uh, a, a Christian today, though we didn't have Christians or the, the term right then. But he was a God-fearing person. He made it very plain that his God was the God of the Hebrews, the God of Israel. But you see, when God is the director of your life, when Christ is the director of your life, remember again, do you tell God what to do or does God tell you what to do? Yeah, God, God tells you what to do. God's going to tell Jonah to do something, but Jonah's going to go the opposite direction. As a matter of fact, God's going to tell Jonah to go to his worst enemy, the Ninevites. I don't know if you can see this right here, but he, here's where uh, Jonah is. God's going to tell him to go over here to Assyria. That's the capital of Assyria, uh, to Nineveh. And He's going to go the opposite direction to Spain, Tarshish, which is over a thousand miles away. Have you ever done that before? God tell you to do something and you go in the opposite direction. 
Well, what you're really saying is, is that you're no longer the authority of my heart. You're no longer the most valued individual in this relationship. I am, and I'm going to do this uh, in my own way. And this is what causes the problem for Jonah, and that is he goes in the opposite direction. Why, why does he go? Let me, let me tell you what God tells Jonah to do. See, God is not a respecter of person. He doesn't care if you're Asian. He doesn't care if you're black. He doesn't care if you're Hispanic. He doesn't care if you're white. He, he doesn't care if you're Native American. God just loves people, and he believes so much that you are the most valued thing that he has made that he was willing to die for you. That's right. That's why Jesus dies for you. He doesn't die for the dogs. He doesn't die for the roaches. He doesn't die for the ants. He doesn't die for the fleas. I know everybody was all upset, and let me tell you what, I don't blame them about Cecil the lion, you know, that got killed. But God dies not for lions. He dies for you. And he dies for each and every one of us. And God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, Jonah hated the Ninevites because they were the enemy. This was not quite at the time when Assyria had conquered the 10 northern tribes of Israel, but it was getting close to the time. And God says to Jonah, I want you to go there and tell them to repent. I want you to go there and tell them, turn to me. I want you to go there and tell them that I love them. Let me tell you what that would be like. My, my people came, or my history, historically, Africans, uh, Americans came from Africa. And we came here on slave ships. And even after, uh, and we were slaves here in, in America for, for 300 years. And even after slavery, there's another group that emerged that was called the KKK. Anybody know what that stands for? Hey, you even know that. The Ku Klux Klan. It would be the same thing as God telling me, Leroy, I want you to go to the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, God. And I want you to tell him, you want me to stab them? You want me to shoot them? No, I want you to love them for me. Get the picture? Yeah. But you know what? That's what God's saying to you. That if I'm going to be your most valued relationship, you can't get around it. You cannot get around it. Matthew 5, 44, he says, I want you to love your enemies. But God, I want to kill them. You ever felt like that? You know, you didn't really kill them, but in your heart. Anybody ever had somebody like that? Boy, I could just kill you. Remember I was talking about my kids a few minutes ago? They spent some time. I want to kill them. I have that little room down in my basement where I've killed my kids a thousand times when they did bad. I want to just taste them. But this is what God, you got the picture? This is what God is telling Jonah. I want you to go to your worst enemy. And these were some bad people. These were some evil people. If you want to really know about how evil they were, read the book of Nahum, which is kind of a, akin to the book of Jonah. And it kind of talks about how atrocious they were and some of the atrocities that they did to the people that they conquered. He says, those are the people I want you to go and love on. All right. How do you get? Christ in your heart. Well, number one, admit that you have been doing what he wants you to do. Admit that you're a sinner. In chapter 1, verse 12, Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. You know, yesterday we gave an invitation and a number of people came up. One of the things that I neglected to do, and I believe any time we, we do give out the word, that we should give an invitation. But there may have been somebody in the group that doesn't have a relationship with 
with God. You just go to church, and that's not the same thing. That if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you have to admit that, I don't have a relationship with you. I'm, 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 I'm living away from you, and now I want to get. It doesn't mean that you become perfect immediately. It doesn't mean that you become uh, all, all cleaned up. What it means is, is that God starts to see me differently, and he has this relationship with me now. So admit that I'm a sinner. The second thing, accept your discipline. The Bible is, is very plain. When we've lived away from God, when we've done things, I don't, you know, even if people don't see you, God's got it built into the system that you, you do have, there are consequences when you do wrong. There are consequences when you get away from, from God. I don't care how much pleasure you think that it brings you, there's consequences. The people didn't want to do it, but it says in 115, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. Yeah, there's, there's always calm. I could, I could go into that much deeper, but you do need to understand that whatever you do in life, it comes back to you. When you do bad things to, to people, that bad, you're going you're gonna to see it again. When you lie or you steal or you gossip about folk, let me tell you what, it's going to come back, back to you. And you know what's even worse? Sometimes... As parents, I'm going to talk to some of the older people. I've been talking to younger people here. I want to talk to the, the, the parents for a minute. Sometimes we feel as if, you know what, I can do whatever I want to in my house. It's my house. I pay the mortgage and so forth. And so, you know, if I want to drink a little drink and if I want to uh, get a little high, uh, with my family have my little stash down here. And some people may even say, you know what, I may even want to smoke a little marijuana. It's legal now in some places. You have to understand something, that what you do may not hurt you, but the consequences may hurt the next generation. There's nothing worse than you seeing your kid as an addict. You got by, but your kid didn't. Am I making sense to you? The payment is not just for you. Sometimes it's for your own family. There's nothing worse than seeing your kid as an alcoholic. Because you said that this is allowable, and I'll, I'll do what I want to do. I have to accept my discipline. The third thing is to ask for forgiveness. First John 1 and 9 says that there's nothing you can do. I don't care whatever you have been involved in, that God cannot forgive you and begin the cleansing process. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me, and from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Uh, when, we, when we give the invitation, there ought to be another group of people, and I believe that oftentimes this ought to be the biggest group of people, and especially in an assembly like this. I don't think that we ask for forgiveness enough. I'm talking about us as Christians because we think, well, you know what, I'm saved, and, and I don't have to do anything. Uh, you know, I can keep living my own life. You, you can, but you, you have to remember, God doesn't take your salvation back, but there's still consequences for when you decide to take your life back over. Each time you do that, there are consequences that come to you. Now, how do you get out of that? You admit it. You accept that discipline. Sometimes the discipline is exposure. And then you also ask for forgiveness. There ought to be a time when we come to the altar. We say, Lord, forgive me for those thoughts. Forgive me for those actions. I didn't mean to say that about that girl. I didn't mean to say that about that boy. You know, everybody was picking on Hoon Lee. Everybody was picking on Angela. Everybody was picking on Leroy, and I jumped in, and that was wrong. I should have asked for forgiveness. And number four, act on God's direction. Get, get God's direction now and do it the way he says it. Jonah 2, 9 and 3, 3 a. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. This is Jonah speaking. But what have I vowed? I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And then Jonah 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. You know, 
Every time I take control back over my life, what I'm saying is that, Lord, I no longer value you. I no longer value your information. Could you imagine going in for brain surgery and you've got your, med- your doctor and you've got the medical book? And you know, some pretty smart people write medical books, right? But when you're doing the, pr- the procedure and you've read the medical book and you decide, ah, you know what? I'm not going to do what the book says. I'm going to do what I want to do. Perhaps maybe you should be a mechanic, you know, and not a brain surgeon. Because if I'm going to be messing with people's heads, then I ought to do the way the book says. Am I wrong or right? Somebody ought to say amen. Well, let me tell you what. Your heart, your relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, I can mess up as a brain surgeon one head at a time. But there are a lot of messed up heads in the world of people who are not thinking right. And if you don't think right, your heart's not going to be right. The second chance, the consequences of when we put God back on the throne is that God will send you back to do what he asks you to do. And he tells him, he says, go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And I'm going to back up here. And he said, what? Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. He did what God, God said. When you do what God says in your heart, we're going to talk about that more this evening. The consequences are is that people start doing what is right. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Look at it. It says that there were 120,000 people in Nineveh, and they got saved that day. You know, Jonah wasn't ha- real happy about that because, remember, he what? How did he feel about the Ninevites? He hated them. Yeah. You know, for many of us, there's going to be some people who make it to heaven that you don't like. And for some of us, we're not going to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ for that very reason because we don't want to see them in heaven. We don't want to see them have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you that is the best thing that can happen to your enemies is when they start a relationship with Christ just like you did. Ways we try to get God in our heart. We go to church. We we say we're going to be a good person. We do a lot of stuff in the church. We do social ministries. That's not the way you get Jesus into your heart. The way you get Jesus into your heart is you apply and you respond favorably to what the Holy Spirit put into your head, what he taught you into your own life. I know that there is some more to this presentation, but Angela, I'm going to stop right there because I believe that you've got enough to know what you need to do in terms of your what? Yeah, your heart. Not talking about this. I want a relationship with Christ. I want to go back just one time before we we do the, the whole thing, and that's this one right here. I want today to be the last day you say you're going to church. I hope that today is the last day you say I'm going to church. I hope nobody in here ever goes to church ever again. This is what I want you to do as we give the invitation. I want you to decide to be the church. Did you hear me? You can go to worship. First of all, you can't go to church. Nobody can go to church. You can go to Bible study. You can go to worship. But you can't go to church. You know why? Because when you accept Jesus Christ, he now lives in you. Look at somebody and tell them, you are the church. 
You can be a poor church, or you can be a good church. The decision is yours. I'm going to ask you to stand. You can cut it off now, Angela. I'm going to ask our music ministers to come, and our time is, is up. I'm going to ask my counselors if they'll come and join me. I remember again, you, you don't have to come just for coming's sake. Um, that, that's not why we give the invitation. We give the invitation. We give the invitation. Listen to me now. We give the invitation so that you can respond. You can respond favorably to what God has said to you. Number one, if God is not, if Christ is not the most important relationship that you have, I'd like to come, I'd like for you to come and let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it a little bit. If you have Christ as the most important relationship, but you're still not allowing him to lead and be the authority over your life, why don't you come and say, Lord, give me a better life. I always use the situation of a husband and a wife. There's a lot of people that get married and they adulterate. Do you know what adulterate means? Adulterate means that you have a similar relationship that you should with your spouse only, but with other people. I don't know of any spouse that would stand for that. As a matter of fact, my wife would kill me. I know it's not funny, but she would. Um, that's not why I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I've got the best relationship with her. Am I making sense to you? And I don't want to blow it. You've got the opportunity for the best relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't want to blow it. How do you not blow it? You apply what you learn to your life, and you grow in relationship with him. Won't you come? You want to just be prayed for today. That door is open. your honor. You're the head. We listen to you. 
I don't deserve this relationship. You are way better than me. But I promise you, I'm going to 